Okay, good morning, everyone. I am so excited to see so many folks here, and we have so many people at home as well. Um, I'm going to give an update, and we're going to be following this with a panel discussion in which I'm going to be joined by many of my colleagues that are the scientists doing a lot of hard work behind the scenes. And then this afternoon, we're also going to be having some small group sessions for those of you here in person. Um, so you're going to have plenty of time to ask questions. And of course, you can grab any of us uh, out and about as we're here through the meeting. So I'm going to try and go slowly. You, for those of you who know me know that that's sometimes hard, but I am going to try and go slowly because I know we have many people listening in many languages. Um, and if someone sees me going too quickly, just tell me to slow down. So I'll get the hint. Um, as we're doing this, I'm also joined behind the scenes by many of my colleagues at something that we call Simon Searchlight, and I'll explain that a little bit, but many of you have been the data that I'm going to show today. So in other words, these are your data, these are your answers, and it's by putting it all together that I think we can understand how to be able to take care of our young people going forward. So just to show you a little bit behind the scenes, these are the this is the team that's behind the scenes working every day to be able to gather the data and distribute the de-identified data. So none of the information that you gives us has anyone's name associated with it. No one knows who you are, but yet you can be able to get armies of scientists working for you by putting this together. So as we do this, I'll show you in a second, but it is clear to me that we are just at the beginning of understanding Jordan syndrome. So in other words, I think we've learned a lot, but our young people are still young, and we need to know and understand what this is like over the entire life course, because our young people have a long time to come. And so as we're doing this, we're trying to, through meetings like this, share our experiences to know what's working, maybe what's not working and be able to do more of the what's working. And so I encourage you, grab us and tell us about your experiences in case we're not asking the right questions because we're asking the things that we think about but we don't think of everything and it's really you all as Dr. Mom, Dr. Dad, Dr. Grandma, Dr. Grandpa who know the questions that we should be asking. Okay. As we do this, um, many of you have been doing this online, uh, some of it by telephone, and we have tried to build in so that people around the world can do this in the language that they're comfortable with. I will admit that we don't have every language so far, but we are trying very hard to come out language by language with the ones that we're seeing most commonly. You will also see, and many of you have already been part of it this morning, that upstairs from us, we're also collecting blood samples. And we're collecting those blood samples, again, for those researchers you're going to hear about, because that way we can study your family member in the laboratory. It gives us the ability, without having to go back to you repeatedly over time, and being able to make sure that you're represented. Because everyone is not the same, as you know from looking around at this meeting, and we need to make sure everyone is represented as much as we can. With this, I hope that many of you are also feeling like you're getting information back from the study. So you're doing it today and we will have this information posted so you don't have to furiously take notes. If there's anything, these slides themselves will be posted. I don't care if you take pictures, if you want to snap anything, but we will post all of this. The recording will be posted. You'll be able to share it with your doctors or teachers or therapists. Um, but also, because we don't have these meetings all the time, we're also coming up with, I call these snapshots, but ways of being able to give you the information back continuously. Not quite continuously, but more frequently in terms of the information. As we do this, uh, one of the things I mentioned, the donating the blood samples, um, today has been really important for many of you who are from Europe or outside the United States, because especially with COVID, it's been difficult to be able to get those blood samples from afar. So I especially thank those of you who are outside the United States, because we again want to make this an international effort. As we're doing that, I, I want to be very transparent. Uh, we're making something called induced pluripotential stem cells. That's a mouthful, even for those of you who speak English. But what we're doing within that is taking blood cells, and for the individual with Jordan syndrome, we're, believe it or not, making brain cells in a dish. 
It goes through a very complicated process to be able to do that, but we can do that to understand the neurons that are most important in this condition and not have to do any poking. We don't want to do brain biopsies in any of your children, and so this is a way for us to be able to recapitulate what it is in people. Otherwise, as you'll be hearing about, we have mice, we have other ways of being able to study this, but we want to be able to study it in your individuals. In doing this, we know that many researchers find this very, very valuable. And so we've made a resource that I'll be showing mainly the researchers out there, but a, a library of actually many, many different genetic variants in the PPP to our 5D gene so that everyone is represented and we know how the gene is working in many different individuals. This is the process that we go through. I'm not gonna go through all the details because it's not so important, but the point is is that we can make brain cells. We can also theoretically make any other cell type in the body that a researcher might want to. So although I personally think the brain is where most of this is at, if one of the researchers in the future comes out and figures out that the heart is important or something in the intestine is important, we have the ability to go back and make those cells for the researchers as well. Okay, so let me get down to the heart of the information that I think you want to hear about. So with this, uh, this is a process whereby after you sign up, we've been taking and reading uh, your genetic test report, and many of you are saying, why do they need to do that? We do that to make sure that, in fact, that genetic variant is a genetic variant uh, that we think is contributing to your family member's condition. And every once in a while, we find that it's actually not the right club. That is, that someone that thinks that this is the club they belong in, it's actually not correct and they belong in some other club. So we wanna make sure everyone gets to the right location. Um, if you've heard from us that in fact you're in the right location, <laughs> if you've gone on in the study, that means that this is your diagnosis and you're in the right place. After we verify that this is the right place, many of you have been talking with one of the genetic counselors on the telephone and then putting information in online. And I'll just warn you that we're not done. We're gonna do this with you every single year to understand how this changes over the life course. And as I said, some of you are providing some samples. For the researchers out there, and I say this for our team here and anyone who might be watching remotely, this is what we have already in place. I estimate that after the meeting today, we'll actually double these numbers based on how many of you have signed up in terms of doing this. And if there are things we need to do from any of the blood samples, again, all of this is de-identified, so no one knows who you are, but yet we can expand this so that many people can all study you and your family without having to bug you again and again for samples. Again, this is mostly for the researchers, uh, but these are those IPSCs, or induced pluripotential stem cells, that either we've made or are in the process of being made. And the point that I'm making here in showing you all of this, and I'll get to it in a little bit more in the next couple slides, is that there are many different genetic variants. And so I'm showing you all of these. Some of you may not know your particular variant, and that's okay. The part of the reason that I said you could come back to this later is if you can't remember exactly what the address is, you could go and look it up later and you could go and see, oh, that's me, that's what re represents my child. And if you don't remember, it's not such a big deal. Mostly everyone is more the same than they are different. So most of what you're gonna hear applies to the whole community. Most of it is not so unique. I'll also say to the researchers, um, just an open invitation that if there's anything we've missed in terms of what you need, certainly just send me an email, let me know, and we'll be glad to make sure that it's represented. So I'm gonna show you on this slide and the next couple slides, this is uh, an aggregation. This is a summary of the different genetic variants that we have in our community. And this is the number of individuals, and this is each genetic variant that we're seeing, and this just simply says that you're in the right club, that this is something that we consider to be associated with Jordan syndrome. What you'll see is this, this distribution is not even. That is that it's not as if there are 5% of people for each one of the genetic variants. In fact, and I'm sorry, my eyes are getting old. Uh, what you'll see is that most people uh, have a certain number of variations that we see clustered within this region, and that's not a coincidence. We know that there are particular reasons why we see that. 
This is just a visual representation of the same thing to show uh, on a stick figure, um, on a one-dimensional way of looking at this, where the genetic variants are located. And I will point out that there are a few, uh, not very many, but these ones in yellow below the line are people who registered with us that at the end of the day, we're not sure that's the right club. So just to give you a visual image, most people do come in the right club and, and we verify that information, but there are a few that are different. Importantly, though, and I will say that this has been in part due to the amazing work of our research team, we have a much better sense now of the three-dimensional structure of the protein. And this might not seem like a big deal, but it really is a lot of hard work to be able to see exactly what that protein looks like. And now that we can see that, we know that most of the genetic variants that we see in our group are actually clustered in three-dimensional location in a very specific place. And this specific place is at the catalytic site of what we call the phosphatase. So this particular gene is a protein. It makes a protein, which is responsible for taking phosphate groups off of other proteins and regulating those other proteins. So it kind of acts as a conductor for an orchestra, and it's like adjusting the volume is the way I think about it. But it's adjusting the volume on the entire orchestra the woodwinds, the brace, the brass, the percussion, it's coordinating all of those activities. And this is the spot where it does its business, and it looks like these particular genetic variants that are very close to that may be having an effect on the volume adjustment of what goes on in the orchestra. And so it's something that the research team has been working very hard, even the last few days, putting their heads together, uh, sort of duking it out in terms of trying to figure out what are the important experiments to figure out what what are the most important instruments in the orchestra? How are they having their effect? And how might we do something to be able to compensate for those differences that we see in your children based on that one single small, very small genetic variant, but that has an important difference in terms of how those other proteins are regulated and ultimately how the brain is working. And so this is something we haven't completely figured out yet, um, but again, we've got a bunch of really smart people uh, here and at home working on this. Okay, so let me get down to some of the news I hope uh, you can think about in your day-to-day -day lives. So I wanna start by saying all of the amazing things about our young people, and I do really wanna emphasize the amazing things. I, I have to admit that I get no more joy than coming to the meeting and watching everyone dancing and singing and celebrating together, um, and that's really the sense that we get in terms of what you've told us about our young people. They're happy, they're smiling, for the most part, right? Everyone can have a bad day, but for the most part, they are joyful individuals. They have an amazing positive energy. There are so many things that they love doing and that they love life as they're doing. Admittedly, there are some challenging behaviors every once in a while, for some of you more so than others, and I totally get that. And I also think there are probably some life transition points, some times in life where some of those behaviors can be more challenging, either because things are changing in their lives or because in some cases of things that are changing in their bodies with puberty and with other changes, and so I think we're starting to see that as we look over time at what's happening to people. But I will say, and I'm gonna come back to it in a little bit, about a quarter of our community has been diagnosed with autism, and I understand in terms of why people are diagnosed with autism, but I also wanna emphasize that they are very positive and very social individuals who love being able to be loved and be able to give that love. And so let me also say that within this, I, I want you to understand that some people think of autism in one way, and I think our community's autism is a different type of autism in many ways. Okay, so as we're doing this, uh, the other one other point that I'm going to make even more explicitly is from a health point of view, they are mostly healthy young people, and it doesn't look like that's changing. And so for those of you who are newer to the community, I want to give you that reassurance. The more data we get, the more confident I get that in general, health is good. I'm gonna come back to seizures. That's one of the things that we are, I think is on our radar in terms of things that we need to be careful about But when it comes to things like any cancer risk, any heart risk, things like that. We're not seeing those pop up. Um, I will say, and I'll get to it again a little bit later, that we do have some issues in terms of body weight and sort of uh, either being a little too small or a little too big. And so the, the, those are things that I do think we need to think about. And COVID, I know, has been making it more difficult. So I acknowledge that portion of things. 
Um, in terms of daily life, I think our young people continue to make progress going forward, but as I'll be showing you, I know it's limited, I know it's challenging, but one of the things I urge you all to share with each other is I've seen, I call them life hacks, but I've seen so many things that you all have figured out in part by trial and error, and in part by sharing with each other, and sharing in some cases with your special needs communities at home, but things that you have figured out, and some things that technology has helped us to figure out how to be able to hold up and to be able to support our young people. And so I especially will say for those individuals who may be from other countries where things may be very different, uh, be sure and share, like I said, either some of the things that have been really helpful or some of the things that have not been helpful um, because our young people definitely like technology. That's one of the things we've learned. Uh, being able to use that in a positive way, I think is one of the tricks. And so I am optimistic though, and if any of you happen to be software engineers out there, you've got an especially important role potentially that you can play. Okay, so here are the data. And for those of you that are really sort of data scientists, even if you're not biologists or in the medical field, I am gonna show you the data at the risk of overload for some of you. So I'm gonna have the numbers up on the screen so you can dive as deeply as you want to in the data, but I'm gonna have the high level take home that I'm gonna say out loud. So for those of you who are not data deep people, just listen to me. You can close your eyes. You don't have to look at the slides if you don't want to. So this is a distribution of the age of our young people. And an important thing that you're going to notice is that most of them are even before, below the age of 10. So that's a limitation in terms of what we know. We do have, every once in a while, an older person. In fact, there's one. But most of our people are young people. And I do think that this group here that is still evolving in terms of teenagers, adolescents, and young adults, they're kind of at the forefront. They're teaching us a lot and we have to listen very carefully because those to me are some of the challenging times. They're challenging times because bodies change, hormones change, and especially after young people graduate from high school, a lot of the supports that we have for them in terms of stability change. And so I think these are things that we're paying very, very close attention and we're trying to learn as much as we can from those individuals. One question that people often ask me is what happened? Was there an explosion? Did, the, did Jordan syndrome just you know, explode in this new era of young people growing up? There's like an outbreak, like there's been a COVID outbreak. And the answer to that, I see some of you shaking your heads, you know the answer is no to this, right? Those young people, those older adults, they're out there. They just don't know it, right? So one of the things that you all, we all can do together is to be able to find those individuals. They are out there, but if you think back to your journey about how you got to here today or how you got at home today, at some point you had a genetic test, right? At some point, either you or one of your doctors or one of your therapists said, you know what, maybe this could be something that might have a genetic basis. Maybe you should get this genetic test. I wanna urge you that I can say I, in particular, in the United States, have been working very hard in Congress to be able to pass laws so that everyone can get access to that same genetic test that you had, but it is not yet universally available either in the United States or in your other, the other countries we have represented. So I will urge you, spread the word in your communities, whether it's in your schools, in your neighborhoods, uh, within your whatever the political infrastructure is that you have, because if those individuals don't get the test, although there are some physical features that you can notice, so you can, may notice someone with a larger head size, or there may be a physical feature that you notice, most doctors don't recognize this condition. I will tell you that this is a rare condition still, and they will not likely make the diagnosis unless they have that genetic information. I will also say that in your communities, if there's anyone with an autism diagnosis that is concerned and doesn't have access to genetic testing, I have a sister study called SPARK, S-P-A-R-K. And if you just Google that and Google my name, you'll come to the website. And by joining that study, if you are in the United States, we can get the genetic testing that then gets them to a diagnosis. And that's true whether it's this condition of Jordan syndrome or whether it's something else. But the point being is that we need to get our numbers, especially in our older individuals. That'll be key for us. Okay, what do we see in everyone? We see some degree, and I'm showing you the percentages here, and just so that you know how to read these slides because they're all going to look the same. 
These are the number of individuals who we have data on for this one data point. So we have 82 individuals that I'm showing within this graph. Of those 82 individuals, 78% uh, or 78 or 95% of them, the parent responded or the guardian responded that there was intellectual disability or developmental delay. So these are all based on what parents are reporting to us. So essentially, I would say everyone has some degree of delay or depending on their age, it may be called intellectual disability. And I don't think that's surprising to anyone. When we start to break it down, and I'll get into more detail, there's a lot of issue with language. And some, if you look at our community, individuals are, there are some individuals who are nonverbal. There are other individuals who might be minimally verbal. They have a few words or they can put together some short phrases. There are fewer individuals who are completely verbal and speaking in full sentences. And so that's what I mean when I say language delays. As I was saying, about a quarter of our participants have autism, an autism diagnosis, and for most of them, they got that in terms of from one of their doctors or a psychologist in the community. This is, uh, I think, as I'll show you a little bit later, depends a little bit on age, but some of the individuals have problems with focus, so we call this attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, and so they have problems focusing, and in some cases, there are medications we can use for that. Some individuals have problems with anxiety. They get nervous when things change, and so as much as we can, we try and prepare them for that. And then there are some individuals with obsessions or compulsions, things that they feel that they either need to do or they need to have done in a certain way. And I don't think, I think this probably resonates in talking with many of you. I think this is uh, accurately representative of what we're seeing and what you all are seeing. So when it comes to medical issues, again, I want to be mostly reassuring in terms of the medical issues that we're seeing. Uh, again, this is by the same 82 individuals, and this is showing you by percentages. Um, and you can tell just when we go around individuals wearing glasses, right? I myself would be in this category in terms of, and those of you who see me know my eyes are old as well, but I have visual issues. Uh, so many of our kiddos have visual issues as well. Um, I will say for some of them, they're changing a little bit over the life course. So it's not necessarily just glasses one time and done, and I know all of you know this, but just continuing to get the eyes checked up because the eyes for them are obviously the windows into how they're perceiving the world, and we want them to be accurate. We don't want them to have trouble navigating what already is difficult for them to navigate. Other than that, we see some tummy troubles. So we see some gastrointestinal issues, and this can alternate. Sometimes it's diarrhea, sometimes it's constipation. It depends on the day, it depends on what we had for dinner. Um, but those times often can be, they can't always tell us what's going on, but yet they feel it, and sometimes it comes out as behavioral issues. We can get more into it in the smaller group sessions, but just to acknowledge, I think this is part and parcel. I don't think this is coincidence. And this is something we see with many other neurodevelopmental orders as well. I'll get into the endocrine issues, but they can sometimes be smaller and sometimes be larger. And I think we've seen some changes, as I said, with COVID with that. Um, orthopedic issues I'll get into, and these other conditions I really would not worry about so much. And so some of these, although you'll see them, I'll talk about them one by one, but I don't want you to get nervous. They're, they're not a huge issue. So neurologically, uh, and for those of you who are working with our physical therapy team, uh, I hope you had fun. I know they, they enjoyed working uh, with many of you. One of the things they notice and we notice and you notice uh, is that the muscle tone is low. I think that's coming mostly centrally from the brain in terms of the signals that the brain gives to the muscles to work. Um, we shall see if it's anything more than that, but I think it's mostly the brain. And again, many of you know, and many of the first tip-offs uh, for you may have been brain size. So when your pediatrician was measuring head circumference, that's something that we see and it's not coincidental. And we know based on the proteins that are uh, regulated in the orchestra, we actually know some of those proteins that are involved that make the head size be larger. And so that makes sense to us scientifically about how these pieces go together. I don't want you to be worried that this is water on the brain or hydrocephalus or the brain is going to explode or it's nothing like that, right? I mean, it is what it is um, in terms of a larger head size, needing to get larger helmets or larger hats or things like that, um, but it's not long-term going to be a big issue, although I think it does to a certain sense explain some of the balance issues early on. I think the mechanics are harder for our kiddos as they're first starting to do things like sitting up and walking. Their center of gravity is a little bit different and it makes it just a little bit more challenging. 
We also see issues in terms of coordination. And so you've been watching your children as they've been growing up and learning how to go up and down stairs and being able to coordinate, whether it's movement with their hands. It just takes a lot more practice and it takes a lot more time in terms of repetition. Um, but many times with adaptive equipment, with very patient therapists, with very patient parents, um, and doing those things over and over again, they will eventually come. So especially for those of you who have young children, I want to tell you, stick with it. I know it's hard. I know it's challenging. And I know on very long days, it's just like you feel like throwing up your hands. But do stick with it. Um, with this, individuals are not losing those skills. So I want to reassure you of that in terms of it doesn't always, they don't always sort of have them down solid. But once they've got them down solid, we're not seeing them lose those skills that they're moving uh, in terms of moving their bodies. OK, seizures. If there's one thing that I think from a medical point of view we need to be a little bit more careful about, it's about seizures. And so for those of you who were here Thursday, what is Saturday, Saturday, Thursday and Friday, um, you'll notice that one of the things we did at this meeting specifically was to put those caps on some of the kiddos' heads and to be able to get electroencephalograms or to be able to look at the brain waves. And we've identified this as a high priority item because of the seizures that we see in some individuals. For individuals, we're seeing this at different times. In different people, I'd say we, I am concerned that during adolescence, we're going to need to be careful. I'm not saying that everyone is going to have this issue. I don't think it's going to be everyone. I don't necessarily think that by genetic variants, it's going to be the same. I'm expecting there's to be some differences. But mainly because there's something we can do. We can treat the seizures. We can get them under control. I want to make sure that we're not missing them. So I can't say that we've analyzed all of those EEG data yet. Believe me, we'll be doing it as soon as we get back to the, to the mothership in terms of looking at this. Um, and this is not meant to be a clinical EEG. So for those of you who did come and do the study, if there's something you're seeing in your child, a movement, a spacing out, a zoning out, uh, any type of what we call generalized seizure where they're really shaking and you can see those shakes, you should not depend on our EEG here to diagnose that. You should talk to your doctors back at home. For those of you who may not be sure and you're a little reluctant, um, most of us have cell phones now where we can actually take a video. And I know in the heat of the moment, sometimes it's hard to do that. But if it's something that happens repeatedly and you're just not sure, are they just kind of out of it or is it really a seizure, I urge you to take a video when, if you can and share that with your doctor for us to actually see it. You know, the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. It really is when it comes to something like this. And if you can kind of snap your kids out of it right away, it's much less likely that it's a real seizure. But do share that with individuals, with your doctors. I'm going to show you a little bit later, but in terms of medications, it does look like there are several different medications that work. And so with that, we want to get those seizures under control. Otherwise, uncontrolled seizures definitely interfere with brain function and with learning. And so we want to get those under control if they're an issue. The reason I put the seizure types here, and I don't expect you to you know, be an epileptologist and know each one of these different types, but the take home message for your doctors is there are many different types of seizures that are associated with this condition. And so they have to be on the lookout for anything that could be just very, something very subtle, like a little twitch of the body to a full blown, what we call grand mal or tonic clonic seizure. So it's the full spectrum of that that we can see. And it's really helpful if they can get a video EEG. If the seizures are frequent enough that they can capture the brain waves at the same time they're literally watching what your child is doing with you pushing a button and being able to say, this is right now, this is the time that I'm worried about, this is what I'm seeing, what do you see in the brain waves at the same time? Being able to put all three of those pieces of information together can be very helpful to either reassure you that what you're seeing is just a behavior but not a seizure or in fact something that needs to be treated. So I, I spent a little time on this one because again, it's an important point if there's something you're worried about. I do want you to go home and talk to your doctors about this. Otherwise, in terms of the vision, there are all sorts of things, again, that we can see with the vision. 
Sometimes it's cross-eyed or lazy eyes. Um, sometimes that might need either patching or surgery. Sometimes it's a matter of glasses. And again, over time, needing to change a prescription perhaps on the glasses. But I will tell you, if you don't go already, a special needs pediatric ophthalmologist can be worth their weight in gold in the sense that it's hard to be able for our young people to see what they're seeing. And so you need someone who can both take care of a child with special needs and know how to be able to see how they're seeing with that. Um, with this, though, this is oftentimes remediable. So in other words, there's something we can do about it. And so we don't, every one of those things I'm emphasizing, if this is news we can use because there's something we can do, we don't want to miss it. That's kind of the combination that we're trying to do as we're going forward. Um, again, as we do this, uh, one of the things that we see, and this changes a little bit over the life course, um, is what is oftentimes early individuals who are having trouble growing. Trouble because sometimes it's the mechanics of feeding, the sucking, the swallowing, the throwing up and regurgitating when they're little ones can be a bigger issue, and so they may have trouble both gaining weight as well as growing taller. They do tend, our young people do tend to be on the shorter side. So I'm not talking teeny tiny, but they do tend to be on the shorter side. So I don't want you to have a panic attack when you see that. One of my goals is that eventually we will have a growth curve specifically for Jordan syndrome. By putting all of our data together over time, we'll be able to say, this is what normal, all of you go to the, or many of you go to the pediatrician and they plot out and they say, and you know, they look at a quote unquote normal growth curve and then they say that, oh, but your child, they're not quite, you know, they're below the curve or they're at the 10th percentile. What we really need is something that's specific for Jordan syndrome. So we know for our community, is this what we expect for our community or not? So stay tuned. That's one of our goals to be able to get there and have them specifically for males and females as we're doing that. We don't have enough yet to be able to do that, but we're getting there. Another thing, though, that is starting to emerge, and I would say starting based on, in some cases, medications that we're using, in some cases based on COVID and being stuck at home and not being able to do usual sort of activities, and in some cases, I think it's actually based on the way the brain perceives hunger and uh, in terms of some behavioral issues. Uh, some individuals may have challenges in terms of tending to gain more weight. This is something that I don't know this for a fact, but I can tell you scientifically we're paying very close attention to this because part of this orchestra conductor we're worried about, we're not worried about, but what we're noticing is that it may have effects also in what we call metabolism. So it may affect the way the body is processing foods in the way that it's distributing small molecules of energy. And so we're paying very close attention to see is there problems in terms of weight gain? Will that perhaps lead to problems with diabetes? I don't know, so I'm not saying for sure that it is. Um, but when we think long term about health issues, we want to keep our young people on a trajectory towards a life of health. And as, as we're doing that, we want to minimize risk of things like diabetes or heart disease. And so we're watching that very carefully. So stay tuned in terms of that. Okay. I put this up in terms of medications because to me this is a sign of how serious a condition is. If it was serious enough that you felt that you needed to use a medication, then it sort of comes up on my radar as serious enough to think about. And then as I'll get to, the next thing we're looking at is not just that you use a medication for something like sleep or seizures, but what medications are you using and what ones seem to be working and what ones seem not to be working. And so within this, uh, one thing I will say is sleep is something that's really important. And you all know this, when you get a good night's sleep, you just feel better the next day, right? You're fresh, you're more able to, you know, just feel good, be good, behave well, learn better. Um, and so sleep is kind of a foundational thing for me for our kiddos as they're going to school and as they're learning things. Because of that, I am concerned that not everyone is getting a good night's sleep. And so within this, I do think it's something important. I'm gonna plant a seed that one of the things I would like us to be able to do in the future is some monitoring at home. So when you're sleeping in your own bed, when you're sleeping up here in the hotel, I know it's not a regular night's sleep. So we'll probably wanna do this when you're at home, but being able to actually gather data to be able to know how are individuals doing when they're getting a good night's sleep. 
I can tell you, I tell you with my own kids, I'll put myself out there, I'm asleep when I think they're asleep. I don't know that they're asleep all the time. And so part of this is we need to be able to even, based on what you're reporting, uh, double check and verify. And so there are things that we're trying in terms of both what we call nearables or wearables, uh, but ways of being able to directly monitor sleep in home uh, to understand whether or not that is a good night's sleep. So stay tuned, uh, but it's something that we're thinking about. There are also certain things that are challenging behaviors, and I know some of you have been talking about and will continue talking about through the weekend about some challenging behaviors, uh, aggressions, outbursts, um, things that may be uh, tantrums. Um, sometimes in the little ones, it's, it's easier to manage. Um, one of the things uh, we are, I am concerned, is that as some of our young people are getting just physically bigger and older, some of those tantrums and outbursts become a little more difficult to manage. And when you're out and about, uh, it becomes, uh, for some individuals, even more difficult. And, and I don't want it to be something where you don't go out and about because you're worried about those behaviors. And so that's something I think we need to, as a community, continue to keep an eye on. Because of that, some folks are using even things like sedatives or something to take the edge off of things, and we're also starting to notice people using uh, cannabidiols, um, so medical marijuana, basically, or something in terms of being able to control some of those challenging behaviors, in some cases for seizure medications, but we are starting to notice that. And again, uh, I'll be interested because I know the laws and regulations are different around the United States and around the world in terms of this, and I would say the jury's still out in terms of how this is working. I will also say that I don't think all of these medications are good for all ages, right? And so what I'm not showing you here is superimposing this, how old individuals are at the time they're using these medications. But for those of you who have children less than five years old, I don't want you going out and filling prescriptions for all of these things. Uh, we need, you need to talk about these with your doctors. Um, with this, uh, I did want to put this up here for your doctors. If you do have uh, medications that you're using for seizures, what I would say is, in a good way, uh, many medications look like they are working for seizures. And I think there are many different seizure types, as I said. Um, within this, it's a little bit of trial and error is what we've been seeing. Uh, trial and error in the sense that some medications can be sedating or some doses of some medications can be sedating. In other words, you get sleepy. And so we don't want our kiddos just zonked out all the time in terms of being able to control their seizures. And so there's a balance of what medication to use and how much of that medication to use. But again, the good news to me, and if you ask some of the other doctors here, I think they'll say the same, is that we're not seeing things like needing to use three or four medications to be able to get the seizures under control. And for those of us who worry about some conditions that are like that, that's good news to me. Um, so I do think this is achievable in most cases with one medication if we need to in terms of the seizure control. And again, um, something to share with your doctors. If you are on medication, if it's working and it's not one of the medications up here, I'm not telling you to switch, right? If you found the good, happy place for your child for their seizures, continue onwards with that. Okay. Um, this is about the, the medical aspect. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the developmental aspects. And so with this, we've been using an instrument called the Vineland Adaptive Behavioral Scale. Um, this is, for me, a nice instrument because it works for all ages, so we can have everyone on the same scale. And I'm going to show you the data in a little bit of a complicated way. So as I told you about, if you're a data-hungry person, it's all here for you. If you're not and you look at this and your eyes just glazed over, then just listen to me. What I'm showing you here is on the x-axis, age, and each dot is a different person. So each of them represent a different person in the community, and I've color-coded this by the different genetic variants. And so I've done this because we're starting to see a little bit of difference between some of the variants. In particular, though, at position 251, or in yellow, there are several different amino acid substitutions at that same exact position, but they're small numbers, so I've lumped all of you together. So pardon me in terms of doing that, but I thought that was the easiest way to look at the data. Here's one point that I'm making. And, and to truth be told, I would say there are more similarities than there are differences in this group. So I would say that in general, the take home message is, is that our young people are gaining skills over time. And this one particular skill, they're all gonna, the next series of slides will all look the same way, but I'm showing you here expressive language. So being able to either speak or gesture or being able to get out uh, language. 
The good thing about this is that there are improvements over time. This is happening over time, but again, showing you their chronological age here, it's taking time. So in terms of being patient, it is taking time. And I've shown you in this dotted line some of those milestones that I think you'll be able to appreciate most easily. So one milestone here is showing you when individuals are able to use single words. And you can see the distribution here. And if you, I'm sure many of you, I can see you whispering to each other or looking at your child and thinking, how old are they? What's their variance? When can I expect these different things to happen? And so again, all of these slides will make available to you. But some of the things that we're seeing is that they are gaining language skills over time. They're able to use single words. And as they're doing that, they're starting to put those words together in simple phrases and, in fact, starting to ask questions. And ultimately, and I know this is a really high bar, but some people are achieving this high bar, is to be able to speak in full sentences and even to be able to tell a story. And so with this, I think there are, and if you, again, uh, ask each other uh, what people have done in terms of some of their speech and language pathologists and done in speech therapy, um, I do think there are some strategies to use. I will also say that within this, I don't think everything is about literally spoken speech. And so I think we have a lot of technologies, and I want to underscore this because I think there, I have been remarkably impressed, for instance, at how much either by use of symbols or use of even words and reading, some individuals are able to do when they may not be able to speak and get the words out. And so either over the life course or for some individuals, ultimately, I'll just say be creative in terms of working with your therapists and educators. I think there's more and more technology that we can use. And what I observe in the kiddos is that sometimes when they can't get those words out and they can't get you to understand what they mean, they get frustrated. And that's what sometimes can lead to some of those tantrums. So um, just parenting uh, advice for me, at least in terms of what I'm seeing. Okay, so this is about expressive language. Uh, we were also trying to think about things that would be very practical. Um, so we're also thinking about personal care skills. And again, the number of individuals here is 45, which I consider a good number, but it's still 45 in terms of this. And again, what I would say here is that what we're seeing is mostly individuals are the same, relatively similar in terms of what they're able to do over time. So looking at this one milestone about being able to use a fork and a spoon, um, and the next in terms of being able to help with getting themselves dressed, and then finally able in terms of self-care skills ultimately to bathe or shower. Um, things are taking time, but things are definitely moving forward. And again, I think the key is, is to think about what are important for you, and oops, what are important things for you in terms of just allowing more independence and allowing more quality of life. And hopefully you're doing that with your therapist and in your individualized educational programs to think about what are skills that are really important in terms of more independence and allow your family to be able to do more as a family. Um, but the good news is these things are coming up over time. I'll also say adaptive equipment can be incredible. And so even simple things like, I just, I, I have to say, so some of you know I'm a pediatrician. Uh, when I was growing up, you tied your shoes, right? And we didn't have anything else except shoelaces that tied, right? And if you look at now, the good thing is I can go to Target and I can get shoes for kiddos that either slip on or with Velcro or with other things where we don't have to be able to tie shoelaces. And so it's just one silly little little example, but my point is that there's a lot in terms of even very accessible adaptive equipment, and for some of you that know, increasingly you can order those things online, and so again, I urge you to share with each other when you find something that's really magical in terms of being able to help with something that's just a really everyday challenge, uh, sometimes those things can be relatively easily solved, and it doesn't take a scientist like me, it takes a doctor mom and a doctor dad like you to be able to do that. Okay. Social skills. Um, to me, this is actually one of our strengths of our young people, and so I want to emphasize that. Um, social skills, to me, are about being able to fit into a community, fit into a group, being able to interact with others, and I think they really, truly do have the joy that I talked about in terms of being able to smile and hug and engage with others. Um, and I do think things that help them in terms of being able to reciprocate. So things that are social skills in terms of even learning to wave hello and goodbye, being able to do do things that engage other people in the community, I think also helps them to feel like they have a community of people that surround them and love them and continue to watch out for them. And so that's why I think some of these social skills end up being especially helpful and valuable. Oops. 
Um, in terms of gross motor skills, so things like uh, running, walking, going up and down stairs, again, we're making uh, progress in terms of this. Um, I'm not so concerned necessarily that they're riding a bike in terms of being able to do this, so just in terms of quality of life, but doing things safely is really important. And so all of those skills in terms of safety, safety in daily life, I think are important. And to me, the good thing is uh, in terms of mobility and independence and going up and down stairs, those are the types types of things that we've been focusing on. Okay, I know we're at 10 o'clock for those of you watching time. I'm, I'm conscious of this, but I'm gonna take just a little bit more time. So we also use another instrument called the Child Behavior Checklist, uh, and this is a little bit more complicated because there are two different age groups that we look at, one for the little ones less than age five, and then one for the older ones. The take home message though is that for the little ones, there is nothing that falls into a clinical range of concern. So whether it's problems in terms of anxiety or aggressiveness or sadness or nothing like that, there are absolutely no concerns for our little ones, our young people. However, this is getting now up into our six to 18, and I will say that where we're having, starting to see a little bit, and I'll just say that this is the zone where I start watching. This zone, I have no concern whatsoever. This is a zone where I'm just starting to watch, and this is where it gets to be significant. Uh, we are not in the significant zone, so that's a good thing. In terms of anything that you might think about as being many major behavioral challenges, we are not seeing that. If we're seeing anything, we are just maybe starting to get to the mild area in terms of a couple of these areas. And the only reason I'm watching this closely is that again, many of our individuals haven't yet hit puberty. And so with puberty, and I will tell you, having kids, just regular kids in puberty, it's its whole other sort of ball of wax for those of you who have kids that are going through that. Um, and so I think there's a lot that goes through just as things change with puberty, but in particular, we're watching our young people. And I would say this is an area where I would say the jury is still out. Okay, so this is just summarizing and putting it all together, and I'll say it just one more time. Uh, I wanna be, I hope you get the message of reassurance. Um, things are okay, medical issues are not coming up, things are not falling apart as the children are older. I think where you are is you've probably, especially after this meeting, for those of you who are here, you have a sense of what, what uh, Jordan's syndrome is about, so I wanna be reassuring in those cases. On the other hand, I also want to acknowledge it's slow in terms of some of the development, but it does develop. Things do go get better, things do advance, um, and then watch out for epilepsy. Okay, just very briefly, I know this is not most of our group here, um, but to say that there are different orchestras with different conductors, and so we have other phosphatases, and one of the things we've learned in the rare disease community is that sometimes there we can leverage what we're doing with one condition with another cousin, something else that's similar. And so I know many of you realize that there are other phosphatases, that's what that PPP gobbledygook at the beginning is. Um, and for this particular group, it's much smaller and just emerging, uh, but I would say there are many similarities. So I'm not gonna go through too much, but to say that the numbers are smaller, we right now only have 14 individuals within this group. And if you look at the number for each of our different genetic variants, this is set up the same way. Here are the genetic variants and here are the numbers. Uh, we're really in a land of onesies and twosies. So it's again, not that we're gonna be there forever, but we do have small numbers now. Just very quickly, those genetic variants tend to be clustered in the same way that we saw for 2R5D. And as we're looking through the information, many things are similar in the sense that our community here is also very young. So just to know that you're not alone, we see this generally, and that the issues are largely the same. That is problems with developmental delay, language delay, and approximately the same number of individuals with autism as well. And so part of why I'm saying this and showing you this is that even if you don't have the same condition, the same life hacks I think are gonna work across everyone in the community. And that's why I think it makes sense to be able to use our economy of scale. Within this as well, we see many of the same neurological issues in terms of low muscle tone, large head size as well, um, as well as some of the problems with movement and coordination with movement. We also similarly see some of the same issues with epilepsy and see epilepsy really across the various different types. And we also see many individuals with vision issues. So again, I think if, if you didn't know any better, you would have said, didn't I just hear her say the same thing? And that's because I really did, uh, except it's smaller numbers that we're seeing here. 
We're also seeing some of the same issues in terms of growth, as well as the weight being higher. And again, I don't mean to be short shrifting anyone. All of these slides will be available to the community afterwards. And then in terms of the medical issues altogether, one of the things I, I just realized I didn't say is that orthopedic issues, when I say that, are largely about curvature of the spine or scoliosis, and we need to watch that during puberty, during adolescence when children are growing rapidly. Um, that's, I think, the time in life where we need to pay attention to that. Uh, again, for this community, medications can be helpful, oftentimes with seizures or with intestinal issues. Um, and then in summary, again, folks tend to be getting advancing in terms of achieving more and more milestones, and once they get them, tend to keep them.